What's up guys, in this video I want to show you what you exactly need to know to understand about domain. The first thing, obviously, is you need to understand what is the definition of domain, right? A lot of students, you know, even through my older classes, they would constantly forget, like, what is domain again? Like, I, I forgot it. So remember, the domain is the set of all x values that make up your function. So you can see in this case, I have a linear function. Well, at least I tried to make it as straight as possible. And in this case, we have this on the x as well as the y axis. So remember, this is just a horizontal number line, and this is just a vertical number line, right? And so you could say like one, you're right, you could say negative one, two, dot, 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 dot. You can still do the same thing vertically. So the domain represents all the x values that make up this function. And another way of thinking about it is like for every value of x, like one and two, is there a point on this graph that is defined? And you could say that, yeah, one, okay, two. And you can say, well, if I keep on going farther and farther to the right, right, I'm always gonna have a point that's gonna be defined on this graph. Why? Because this graph is continuing indefinitely to the right. It's also continuing indefinitely to the left, right? As this graph is gonna keep on going farther to the left, like it keeps on going down, 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 right? All the way down off the screen. But we have no reason to believe that there's gonna be any other issues because that's why we use these arrows saying, hey, whatever this pattern that you see is gonna continue in both directions indefinitely. Obviously, we can't have a number line going down indefinitely. So we say all the way to the right would be representing infinity and all the way to the left is going to represent negative infinity, okay? Now, in this case, you can see that th if this graph is gonna keep on expanding, there's no breaks, there's no holes, there's no issue that we would see, then that for every value of x, I should have a point that's gonna be on this graph. Therefore, the domain in this case is gonna be all real numbers. Now, I'm gonna write the domain in what we call interval notation, basically saying all everything, how far to the left, as well as how far to the right, is this function going to be defined? And since we said all the way to the left is negative infinity, and all the way to the right is positive infinity, we're gonna write the domain as negative infinity to infinity. Now, I'm talking about domain here on the graphical approach. We can also talk about domain in the algebraic approach, and the function or the equation for this graph is going to be y equals x plus one. Now, my graph might not be perfect, but again, let's just assume that this is the correct definition, this is the correct equation, and this is going to be the correct graph, right? The thing I want you to understand is like, for every value of x, like, or any number, think about all the numbers in the whole world, right? Now, let's talk about at least real numbers, but all the numbers in the whole wide world, whatever, whenever I plug one in for x, all I have to do is add one. Am I always going to get an output back? And the answer to yourself should be yes. Like, no matter what number I plug in, right? I'm always gonna get a number back. So that is telling me that my domain is all real numbers, right? No matter what real number in the whole wide world that I plug in for X, I'm always going to add one, be able to add one to it and get a number back out, which is going to be my Y. Also, we could use function notation to represent that relationship. But when my function is defined for all values, we call that domain all real numbers. Now, what about if the function is not contained for all real numbers? That's where a lot of students get mixed up. So now let's go and explore if we actually have something where the function is going to be undefined. What exactly is that gonna look like as a function on a graph, as well as what is that gonna look like in the equation. So now what you can see what I did is I created a little hole, right? And graphically what that's saying is, this function is still defined for all these numbers, except look at one. At one, there is a hole in the graph, right? The function is not defined at one. So the way that we're going to write this in our interval notation is we just want to kind of look at this, say, all right, to the left of this dot, what is the domain? And we could say, well, the domain is still going to be the same thing, right? To the left of the dot here, we are dealing with, it's going to still go to negative infinity, but it's going to go all the way over to one. Now it's not defined at one. So therefore I'm going to use my parentheses here, right? Use parentheses when we are talking about the domain of something not being contained. If it's actually a part of the domain, which we'll get into later in this video, we're going to use a bracket. Now to the right of this dot, right, this undefined value is going to be, it's still going to be defined for all values that are larger than one. So we're going to say from one to infinity. And guess what guys, that is the domain. It's just going to be a collection of these two intervals. So a lot of times we just write them together with a union symbol. It's just really important to understand that we're using parentheses very specifically because infinity is not a defined number. And one, you can see, is definitely not a defined number because there was a hole in the graph. So we can't define it. When I was dealing with just a nice little straight line, it was pretty obvious to be able to understand what exactly the function we were talking about, right? The function that we were talking about there was just y equals x plus one. But what would a function look like algebraically if we actually had a hole in it? Well, that would come up to actually what we're dealing with a rational expression. So in this example, I could write an equation that would look something like this. 
Now, initially, you might say, like, well, how am I supposed to know that this is going to produce that? And really what it comes down to is just being able to simplify this because you see that I still have the y equals x plus 1 equation. So how do I get y equals x plus 1 from this equation? And it all comes down to really just simplifying this, but then also understanding why this value is undefined. So let's go ahead and simplify this and kind of make sense of why we have an undefined value at 1. Okay, so here's a couple things that we, again, we need to be able to understand. First of all, I can simplify this rational expression, right? x squared minus 1 is the difference of two squares. I can break that down into factoring as x minus 1 times x plus 1, right? And then in the denominator here, and again, notice that I can only simplify this because these two terms are separated by multiplication. I can now divide out these terms, this x minus 1 divided by the x minus 1. Those divide out. What that leaves me with is this x plus 1, which again was my original function, right? If you remember, that's the one that we originally talked about. So y is equal to an x plus 1, that's where that line is going to come from. That's why that line is exactly the same. However, there is a distinction here. We have x cannot equal 1. Why did I write that? The reason why I wrote that is because when you plug 1 into this function, right? Remember, remember in the last equation, no matter what number I plugged in for x, I could just add y and I always got an answer. What is the problem when you plug 1 to this equation? The problem when you plug 1 into this equation is you get 0 in the denominator. And hopefully you all know you cannot divide by 0. So when we're talking about a domain, if you had no idea what this graph looks like, the best way to be able to identify if there is a restriction, if there is a hole or a undefined value in your function, when you have a domain, is set the denominator equal to zero. So in this case, all I simply would have had to do is just set the denominator equal to zero and solve. And you can see, one is the value that makes my denominator equal to zero, right? That's why I wrote this equation over here. So what that's telling me though, is the value that makes my denominator equal to zero is the value that is not going to be in my domain. That is why x cannot equal one. That is why one is not in the domain of this function. So when you look at this algebraically, you also wanna be able to simplify to divide things out because if your discontinuity, because if you have a factor that gets divided out, that is going to produce a hole in your graph, which we call a removable discontinuity. But also, it doesn't matter if it gets simplified out or not, you still wanna take the original function, set equal to zero, define the values that are not defined for your original function, not the simplified function, but the original function. Therefore, then you can identify what the domain is either algebraically or from the original graph. But it's important to recognize that not everything is always going to be simplified or to be divided out. Sometimes we're gonna have things that do not divide out and we're gonna have discontinuities that are not holes. They're gonna look like asymptotes. And when that happens, we're gonna to have to understand when that happens compared to when we have a hole. So now you can see I changed things up quite a bit. Now what I did is I added this nice little dashed line. Now this nice little dashed line is supposed to represent a, again, an undefined value of our function, but it's also going to be what we'd call a asymptote. And I want you to recognize something that's special about this asymptote here, is the graph does not, is not defined at the asymptote, right? That's why we have this dashed line. But it's also not, it's not a value that's a part of the graph, but it is a very, very important value because what's happening with this graph from the left as well as from the right to that value, the graph is getting closer and closer and closer to it, right? So when we're trying to understand the domain, we're gonna do the same thing. We wanna look at to the left of this asymptote and say, all right, what is the domain here? And the domain again is going to be from negative infinity to one. And then to the right of this asymptote is going to be from one to infinity. So the domain of this function is exactly the same as the domain of the other function when we had a hole. They were both undefined at one. But the differences are gonna come from the algebraic approach of how we're going to have an asymptote compared to a hole. Remember, when we had a hole, what happened was my denominator got divided out. But in this case, what's gonna happen is my denominator is not gonna be divided out. So if you look at this equation that is gonna represent roughly this equation here, you can see here that the numerator cannot be divided up, or the numerator cannot be simplified, but my denominator can, right? And so what's happening here is we still know that one cannot be defined for this function, right? X cannot equal a one, right? That's still gonna make my denominator go to zero. The difference is I can't simplify this numerator, or at least across real numbers, right? I can't factor that across my real numbers, so therefore nothing simplifies out. So now we know that when you have something that, when you have a discontinuity or a value in your denominator that cannot be simplified out, what that is now going to produce is what we call a vertical asymptote. And again, a vertical asymptote is not defined in your domain. So we always wanna to look to simplifying our function to be able to see if anything divide out. That is gonna tell us if we have a removable discontinuity, which was a hole, or a non-removable discontinuity, which is going to be a vertical asymptote. But it, again, it doesn't matter if it's a hole or a vertical asymptote. If you wanna find the values that the function is defined for, if you wanna find the values that the function is not defined for when you're dealing with a rational expression, 
set the denominator equal to zero and solve. Those are the values that are not going to be a part of the domain. If it's a whole or if it's an asymptote, it doesn't matter. However, that's not the only time that we can have a restriction on our domain. Sometimes we can have a restriction on our domain with no discontinuities. So you can see in this example here, this graph is only defined for values at one and then getting larger and larger numbers, right? There's no part of this function that is defined for any numbers at zero or any negative numbers. So therefore, if we were gonna write our domain, all we'd simply say is say, all right, the domain is from one to infinity. Now, again, remember the difference here when we're writing our domain. When we were writing the domain originally, we, we always used parentheses, but that was because our function was not defined at those values. In this case, one is a closed circle, so therefore it is defined, therefore I'm gonna use a bracket Infinity is not, so I'm gonna use my parentheses. In the previous three examples, we looked at a linear equation as well as some rational expressions. But in this equation, we're gonna be dealing with something different. We're still gonna have a restriction on our domain because our domain is not all real numbers, right? It's only numbers that are going to be larger than one. So what type of function is going to produce a result like that? And then how can we go ahead and find that algebraically if we don't know what the graph exactly looks like? Well, the equation for a function like this is just going to be y equals the square root of x minus one. Now you might be wondering like, how did I know that was exactly the function? Or how did I know that this represents a square root? And again, there's a lot of different functions that have a lot of different domain restrictions, but I wanna focus on this key square root function because it is very important. And we're very used to like, we know we can't divide by zero, right? That's a rational expression. We also know that we cannot take the square root of a negative number in our real number system. So whatever is under our square root, has to be positive. Another fancy way to be able to say that is take whatever is under your radical, which we call our radicand, and set it greater than or equal to zero. Now, all we simply need to do is go ahead and solve for x. Just like we did with the rational expressions where we solve for x, in this case, we can do the exact same thing. Just add a one to both sides. We get x is greater than or equal to a one. So what this is saying is all values that are larger than one, right, or equal to one, like two, three, four, five, six, seven, are going to be defined in your function. Anything that's less than one, right, is not gonna be in your domain. So that is where we're gonna come up with the exact same domain that we were able to arrive at when we were looking at the graph. So when you have a rational expression, make sure you know the difference between a whole and a asymptote and how to find them. Make sure you set the denominator equal to zero and solve to find the values that are not defined for your function. When you're dealing with a radical, make sure you set the radicand greater than or equal to zero to go ahead and find the domain. Now this was a pretty simplistic explanation of domain dealing with some pretty simplistic functions, but if you wanna see me work through multiple or more complicated examples, then check out the next video I have for you here.